Hello, hello, welcome back. Sign of the Beaver, Chapter 17 today. This is Miss Kinder, and I um, hope everyone's doing well, staying healthy. We're going to keep rolling with Sign of the Beaver when we left off yesterday. Uh, Matt, I couldn't think of his name for a second. Matt had gone to Etienne's village uh, where they were having a celebration for the bear that uh, Etienne had killed, and of course, Matt was a big part of that, and so he had gone to the celebration. Initially, was a little bit afraid, um, but joined in, had some bear stew, and then was led uh, over to one of the, um, it was like a wigwam or a tent, some sort of a dwelling, where he ended up falling, falling asleep and spending the night. So let's pick back up and see what's happening. Chapter 17, Sign of the Beaver. When Matt woke, the wigwam, it was a wigwam, was dim, but the cracks of brightness around the door flap showed that it was daylight. By the sounds, the village was up and about. He could hear men's voices, the shouts of children, and the shrill yelping of dogs. Behind these sounds, there beat a dull, thumping rhythm. Could the Indians still be dancing? He lay, looking about him at the smoke-streaked walls of woven matting, at the cluster of objects hanging here and there, shapeless garments, cooking pots, odd-shaped bags of animal skin, bundles of dried grasses and herbs. Under the platform where he had slept was an untidy pile of baskets and rolled up mats. From the heap of ashes in the center of the dirt floor, a wisp of smoke curled upward toward a small hole in the roof. Much of it could not escape and drifted back to hanging thin clouds just above his head. Matt's throat felt tight with it and he sat up, coughing. Then he moved to the doorway, pushed back the flap, and stepped outside. As though they had been waiting, children came scuffling about him, their bright eyes curious. Most of them were naked as little frogs. Quay, he said uncertainly, sending them into a chorus of giggles. Matt was relieved to see Etienne approaching. You sleep long time, Etienne greeted him. Too much bear, reckon. Matt smiled shamefacedly. He still found it hard to take Etienne's sober teasing. Sounds like they're finally starting to become friends now. Over the heads of the children, he looked about the village. Last night in the darkness and firelight, it had appeared mysterious and awesome. Now, under the strong sunlight, he saw that it was shabby and cluttered. There were a few bark cabins. For the most part, the wigwams were ramshackled and flimsy. On every side from racks of untrimmed branches hung rows of drying fish. Scattered heaps of clamshells and animal bones littered the ground. The Indians themselves had dis discarded the splendor of the night before. Some, some of them, like Atian, wore only a breech cloth. Others faded cloth trousers and ragged blankets. The women had replaced their bright finery with skirts and vests of dingy blue cotton. Has that ever happened to you? Like you've been to maybe a cookout or a picnic or uh, a bonfire and it was dark except for the light from the fire and maybe it seemed like the place where you were was kind of creepy or mysterious. And then the next morning you wake up and in the light of day, it's like, oh, this is just like kind of a regular old backyard or campsite or whatever. It just loses all of its mystery. Well, that's, that's what's happened here with Matt. Now he could see what was making that rhythmic, rhythmic thumping. Two women were pounding corn in a huge mortar made from a tree trunk. Um, their arms alternately rising and falling. That must be really huge. Others nearby were grinding in smaller mortars and ho of hollowed stones. They sat close together, jabbering like blue jays, but their chatter did not for an instant interfere with the steady rhythm of their bare arms. In front of another wigwam, two women were weaving baskets of rushes. As Matt and Etienne passed them, they looked up with shiny smiles. All the women Matt noticed were hard at work. A very few old men sat smoking in front of the wigwams and a group of boys squatted in a circle, playing at some sort of game. Where are the men, he asked. Gone, Etienne said, before sunup, my grandfather lead hunt for deer. He had brought a hunk of cornbread for each of them, and munching it, they walked through the village back to the canoe. Matt kept hanging back, looking all about him at the village. He wanted to stay longer. There were a hundred questions he longed to ask, but Etienne seemed impatient, his genial mood of the night before he had vanished. So Etienne's seeming a little more serious now. 
Without wasting a motion, he pushed the canoe into the water. A tangle of children had followed them and now stood on the bank, laughing and waving as they moved out into the river. Matt tried to find a reason for Etienne's silence. If it hadn't been for me, he asked, would you have gone on the deer hunt with the men? Etienne did not like the question. Not take me, he admitted finally. I not have gun. Now we are kind of getting an idea of why Etienne seems kind of serious this morning. He's disappointed he didn't get to go on the deer hunt. And apparently he didn't get to go because he doesn't have a gun. You're a good shot with a bow and arrow. Etienne scowls. That old way, he said. Good for children. Indian hunt now with white man's gun. Someday my grandfather buy me gun. Need many beaver skins. Beaver, not so many now. So Adrian saying, if I'm going to get a gun, I got to have enough beaver skins to buy one, but there's not as much beaver around here as there used to be. So it's possible he might never have enough beaver pelts to be able to afford a gun. I know guns cost a lot, Matt said. I'll have to wait a good while for another one myself. Etienne had long since heard the story of Ben's visit. Remember, Ben stole his gun. White man can buy with money, Etienne said. Indian not have money. One time, one time, plenty wampum. Now wampum, no good to pay for gun. So it used to be that the um, form of money that the natives around that area used was wampum, but since the white settlers came in, that's no, that currency is no good anymore. It's only white man money. There was a bitterness in Etienne's voice. Matt understood now why Etienne had defended the beaver dam so fiercely. Was it true that beaver were getting scarce? Matt thought of the village they had just left, how very poor it seemed, how few possessions the Indians could boast. For the first time, Matt glimpsed how it might be for them, watching their old hunting grounds taken over by white settlers and by white traders demanding more skins than the wood could provide. As they set off through the forest, he tried to think of a way to lift Etienne's gloom. That was a mighty fine feast, he said, and I was glad to see where you live. I'd like to go there again someday. Etienne's scowl only deepened. My grandmother not want you come to feast, he said finally. My grandfather say you must. She say you not sleep in her house. Oh, said Matt lamely. His own pleasure suddenly dimmed. So many things were suddenly clear to him. Why he had been left alone to sleep in the empty wigwam. Why Etienne had hurried him away so abruptly this morning. Etienne had been caught in a family argument and was annoyed by it. My grandmother hate all white men, Etienne said. When Matt could find nothing to answer, Etienne went on. White man kill my mother. She go out with two squaw to find bark for make basket. White man come through woods and shoot with gun. My mother do them no harm. We no longer at war with men. With white men, sorry. Just same, they kill forget scalp. White men get money for Indian scalp, even scalp of children. Matt's indignant, indignant protest never got past his throat. He remembered that it was true or had been a long time ago. He had heard that during the war, the Massachusetts governor had offered a bounty for Indian scalps. Etienne must have been a very small child. My father go out on war trail, Etienne said. He go to find white man who killed my mother. He not come back. Matt was speechless. He had never dreamed that anything like this lay beyond, behind Etienne's carefree life. He had never wondered about Etienne's parents at all, only accepted without question that the boy followed his grandfather and obeyed him. No wonder she hates us, he said at last. Terrible things always happen when there's a war on both sides. You've got to admit, Etienne, that there was a reason. The Indians did the same thing to white settlers. The white women were afraid to go outside their cabins. Why white men make cabins on Indian hunting grounds? Matt had no answer for that. It was no use, he thought. The war with the French was over. The Indians and the English had made peace, but the hatred, would that ever be over? For all he and Etienne walked through the woods together, there was a wall between them that Etienne would never forget. In sudden panic, he thought of his own mother. Was it right for his father to bring her to this place? Does your grandfather hate us too, he asked. Etienne did not answer at first. Finally, he said, my grandfather say Indian must learn to live with white man. It was not the answer Matt had hoped for, but Sotnis had said he must come to the feast. In spite of the grandmother, Sotnis had made him welcome.
When my father comes, he said, I want him to know your grandfather. I think they would like each other. So Matt wants his dad to meet Etienne's grandfather. Etienne did not answer, but they walked on in silence. Discomforted, Matt turned his attention to the trail they were following. Presently, he recognized the unmistakable carving of a little animal cut into the bark of a tree. But when he turned to Etienne to boast of his recognition, he was silenced by the darkness in Etienne's eyes. Instead, without speaking, he studied the signs they passed. He marked fallen trees pointing along the path, small piles of stone, and wherever the trail seemed to vanish, he discovered on a tree the sign of the beaver. When they came out at last on a trail he knew well, he marked carefully the spot where the two trails met. Why, he thought in sudden excitement, I could actually find my way to that village. I'm sure I could, but he did not share his thought with Etienne. He knew that unless Etienne took him there, he could never go to that village again. Sockness had only invited him to the feast out of kindness or perhaps out of fairness for his small share in killing the bear. Would he ever be given another chance? Do you see the symbolism there about Matt walking back on the trail and looking at those natural signs and saying to himself, maybe I could find my way back to Sotmas's village. Maybe I understand enough about the Indians and the way they do things now that I could find my way back. And yet he knows that without the invitation and the guidance from Etienne and Sotmas, he'll never go back there. See that the symbolism there and how that mirrors the cultural issues between the white people and the native people in that area. They're trying so hard to sort of meet in the middle, but there'll always be this barrier um, because of the war, because of what's happened um, in the years since their contact. And uh, it makes it difficult for Matt and Etienne to truly be friends with each other. All right, so that's the end of chapter 17. We'll do 18 next time. See you guys, have a great day. Bye-bye.